Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is best known as Duke University's all-time leading scorer, an NBA lottery pick, and one of the most lethal three-point shooters in NBA history, a wine collector, J.J. Reddick. He was born in Cookville, Tennessee, and came from a family that shared an interest in sports. He went on to play basketball at Duke University, where he still holds several records, including all-time leading scorer, and he is the second leading scorer in ACC history. Uh, J.J.'s professional basketball career began in 2006 when he was a lottery pick. Uh, the Orlando Magic selected him with 11th pick overall. And over the course of his 15-year NBA career, he played with the Milwaukee Bucks, the Los Angeles Clippers, the Philadelphia 76ers, the New Orleans Pelicans, and finally the Dallas Mavericks. He is the creator and host of the podcast The Old Man and the Three, and in 2020, he founded the podcasting company 342 Productions. He is an enthusiastic wine collector. JJ has assembled a seller of diverse vinous selections, which he recently discussed in All Stars Uncorked, a digital event sponsored by Acker Wines. JJ is a devout Christian, husband, father, an ESPN analyst, and also a household name. Welcome, JJ. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think you've you've co you covered it all. Very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Very impressive. It, it's the team, man. You know, it's it's, it's the team. Um, tell us about the wine we're drinking this afternoon. Yeah. So, I, look, I I had to bring some red Burgundy. Um, that is absolutely my go-to wine. And full disclosure, and I told you this before we started, I my cellar is not in New York City, and uh, I hadn't been back there since Thanksgiving. So I just had some stuff in my apartment. I actually had this delivered this week. So this is a, a, a Joseph Druhan, uh Bone Romanet mm. Premier Cru. And the interesting interesting thing about this wine is uh, it's actually a blend of three different sites. Oh, wow. They only make about one one to two barrels a year of this. Um, it's Cham, uh, Le Petit Mont, and one of my favorite sites, Malconsor. Malconsor abuts Latash. Okay. And if you get a pure, you know, single site Malconsor, like from Dujac, it's a tenth of the cost of Latash. Right, right. But it drinks just as well. This is a nice little. I have not had this wine. This is the first thing. It's a young wine. It's 2019. We've all opened it. Yep. We've all taken a couple sips. Yep. It's fantastic. Yeah, no. And 2019 is like, is going to be a killer uh, vintage for Burgundy. It's just been declared a killer vintage. Yeah. And like, shit, you know more about Burgundy than I do. And I worked in the wine business. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I, I always tell people all the time, like, once you know, and this is the, this is true wherever in the world you go. Like like once you know vineyards and and terroir, like you know, like you can find shit like for a tenth of the price, you know, like because yeah. um, it's right it abuts and um, so Saint Saint Aubin in uh, in in uh, next to Mont Rocher is like it's just over the hill. It's on the other side of the hill. That's and that you can get P Y. Well, you used to be able to get P Y C M Saint Aubin for like fifty five bucks. Right. Now it's like a hundred and ten. But it's one of the greatest values in, in white burgundy. Well, that remember we were talking about a, a certain next president of the United States. <laughs> yes. that, that actually was the bottle. It was okay. the PYCM yes. Saint Aubin. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That that uh Love that, that. that was one of the, so you know, he a practical man. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the funds now. I know. He totally has the He's funds. He's got the man. funds. He um, could he could afford some Chevy at this point. Well, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, um so you were born in Tennessee, and then um, we start at the beginning. And then, how old were you when you moved to uh, Roanoke? Virginia? It was Roanoke, right? Yeah, we we, we it was a uh, circuitous route to okay. get to Roanoke. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so when I when I was first born, uh, we lived about forty minutes or so north of a town called Cookville, Tennessee, which is basically right in the middle off Interstate forty between Nashville and Knoxville. And originally, my dad, after college, had um, bought some land with some buddies. And he invited my mom down. They went to college together. My dad was a few years older, but he invited my mom down. She was living in New York City at the time, working at an art gallery in Soho for the weekend. And she went down for the weekend. She never came back. They start having kids. Uh, my <laughs> older sisters are twins. Uh, I was the I was next. And uh, on, I've been back as an adult to the property. <laughs> and there were like four or five houses, four different families on this one piece of land. Um, it was basically a commune. I was saying, you it, was a, it, was a, it was a commune without the, the negative connotations of commune. And uh, in the very back of the property, as you got sort of as the holler, holler sort of like elevated into the back of the hill, 
um, there was a hunting lodge, and that's where my mother uh, breastfed me. That's where my mother raised me for the first nine months of my life. And then we moved into town. My dad uh, realized that he, he couldn't support three kids at this time being a stoneware potter, so he got a real job <laughs> and became a, uh, a counselor uh, for, for adolescents who were dealing with substance abuse. And so we moved to Charlottesville. We lived there for four years. He got a better job opportunity in the Poconos. We were only there about 10 months, and my parents were dying to get back to Virginia. Right. So they found a place in, in Roanoke. We moved to Roanoke when I was seven. There's a lot there. First of There's all, a lot to unpack. You're, 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 <laughs> There's a your lot. Your dad to unpack. must have been a hell of a potter to have <laughs> your mom move from New York City, working at our coffee, <laughs> to a commune in Tennessee. My my dad at the time was legitimately one of the best potters in America. Um, and if you, so his his name's Ken Reddick, but uh, his pottery name was Zeke Reddick. That was his nickname that the artists had given him. And if you go on eBay, you can still find. Zeke Reddick pottery from the 1970s. It's pretty wild. That's wild. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so how, is it three of you total, or is there, do you have any younger siblings? Well, then, so my brother was born in in, uh, in Charlottesville when we moved to Charlottesville, okay. and then while we were in uh, Pennsylvania in the Poconos, my little sister was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So I'm I sense I'm the second born right. in theory right. uh, in the birth order, but I'm really the middle of <laughs> yeah, five. Yeah, the middle child. So I have some middle child characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I read somewhere um, that um, I think you were like eight, seven or eight when your dad put up a hoop yeah. in your backyard. And uh, what was the what was his reason for that? Just to get the kids out the house, uh, burn off some energy, or you had five kids? He's like, I can have a basketball team. <laughs> so, so pops pops played uh, in college at Ohio Wesleyan. It's a D three school. He was a good high school player. Okay, um, but th- th- they weren't they weren't necessarily pushing sports or athletics onto us. We were actually my sisters and I were my older sisters and I were were homeschooled. They homeschooled till ninth grade. I homeschooled through fifth grade. Mm. Um, and so we were outside all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were we were building villages out in the woods. We had stone forts everywhere. Um, everything we did was outside. And I basically did whatever my sisters did. <laughs> so there was a time where we um, owned this crazy fucking horse named Shekinah. And uh, my sisters rode. They competed. And, and I learned how to ride a horse. And then they started playing softball. And so I was like, oh, I'll, I'll try – t-ball and baseball i'll do that and then by the time they were 13 they were six feet tall Mm. and so they just picked up basketball at 13 i was eight and dad put up a hoop in the backyard in roanoke and that's essentially where on that court is where i learned how to play basketball and i I tell this all the time but this is the worst basketball court (laughs) you could ever (laughs) imagine it was completely uneven it was a third grass a third dirt a third gravel there was a giant tree bar- tree branch in the, in the left corner, so you had to really put some arc on it, and and the, and the left side was actually lower than the right side. So w- when you're shooting from the left corner, it's like shooting on ten and a half feet, not ten feet. Uh, and then we had a well, and the well, the thing that abutted out of the ground, <laughs> was was in the right corner. So there were obstacles. There were obstacles. But I, I there was something uh, autonomous. Uh, that I found in basketball. And there was something about the routine of going outside and shooting a basketball, watching that ball go through the net, going to grab your ball, dribbling back out, shooting it. I'd do that over and over again. It it would get dark. I would take my dad's lawnmower out to center court, you know, top of the key or whatever. I'd grab an extension cord and I'd clamp a light on and shine it at the backboard. If it snowed, I'd put gloves on, and it used to ice up in the mountains, so you know the, the net would be ice. So I'd be <laughs> shooting on ice, and I have to go get another ball and knock the ball out every time <laughs> I made it. But I was just, I, it, 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 it's a little bit of obsession, mm-hmm. it's a little bit of addiction, um, but but I I found this this thirst to just play basketball mm-hmm. all the time. Um, do you think like, you know, playing on those like those 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 kind of like fucked up courts like where the, you're like like it, it actually makes you a better ball player because like yeah. like when like on the court like it's not a clear path to the basket right so like you you can find weird bounces you you know like oh 
that's going to bounce like it did off the old route, right? right? Yes, yes. Or this is the, I got to pick up the dribble, like, you know, because, like, that would happen on the gravel, yeah. but it might be someone's fight, you know. So, I, 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 like, I've seen kids, like, also, like, in the inner city, they have sometimes some fucked up warp courts. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no net. net. No right? net. So, you, you have Wind to Wind coming it, off the yeah, river. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. it forces you to make adjustments, yeah. I think. I, it's not a, it's to, I, in thinking about it after the fact, what I think it taught me in a way was visualization mm. because it taught me a level of imagination that I had to use. This was not, uh, I, there was no three point arc, you know, there was no foul line. It was all just my own doing. It was my, all my own creating. Mm. Um, and I would, I would rehearse games. You know, I, I, I played in the ACC championship my freshman year at Duke and we beat NC state. Um, I was having an okay tournament. I wasn't playing that well. And then the last 10 minutes, we were down 15 points. The last 10 minutes, I had 23 in the last 10 minutes. We came back and won. And I remember saying after the game, I, I, I've actually played this game before. You played it in your I've head. played this in my head, in my backyard, dozens and dozens of times. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's funny. When you said that, it reminds me of um, uh, Kevin did a uh, special about the DMV uh, mm -hmm. yep. area. And uh, – I can't remember his name right now, but the kid from Villanova when they won a championship, they was like, as soon as soon as soon as they got the ball to me, everybody from that area knew they were gonna win. <laughs> yeah. Like we we do, we used to do that shot yeah. fifty times a day yeah. every day in their head. Yeah. You know, I think it was Chris Chris Jenkins made the three. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um yeah. so like let's uh we're gonna get to Duke, but also like so you take up basketball at eight and then um like kinda what was your 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 journey, like you played at McDonald's All American, like how like how did your how did your game just like, yeah. Besides, your, obviously it, your hard work ethic. It wasn't it wasn't linear. It wasn't linear <laughs> from the hoop going up at eight to becoming a McDonald's All American and a Duke signee. I can tell you that. Um, so a, a couple things happened. Uh, I would say three things that were 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 big. So uh, I loved baseball as well. Okay, I was a great pitcher. I, 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 ego side, I was a great pitcher. I was dominant. I was dumb. I always like to, to tell people this story, but look, I lost one game as a pitcher in, in, in four seasons of pitching, little league and then, and then yeah. fall ball on the big field. I lost one game as a pitcher. There's six innings in a little league game, which means there's 18 outs. Okay. In the game that I lost, I had 17 strikeouts. The 18th out was a grounder back to me that I went and tagged first base myself because I couldn't trust my first base. <laughs> we had so many errors <laughs> that we lost. We lost like six to three, you know. So I, I was I loved baseball, and after my sixth grade uh, year, we played. That was my first year playing in the national tournament for the Roanoke Jaguars. So okay. we go to Salt Lake City. We're there ten days. We play in the tournament, and. I'm exhausted. I get back Sunday uh, from Salt Lake, and my dad says to me that afternoon. I'm taking a nap. He wakes me up. He's like, oh, your Little League All-Star team is playing in the state tournament on the other side of the state. I had forgotten about this. <laughs> so I had a family friend drive me basically through the middle of the night. I get to Portsmouth at like 3 a.m. I pitch the next day. I uh, We went into extra innings. So I, I struck out like 13 batters in eight innings. We win the game. We ended up getting to, I think, the quarterfinals we lost. I get back from the trip, and my dad's just kind of like, look, we got five kids. We don't really have time to be <laughs> going all around the country. You're good at both, but you, you really do need to mm -hmm. choose. And I think it was partially because my sisters now at this time were playing high-level AAU basketball. They were getting recruited Division One, and, and I was five foot six. I hadn't had a growth spurt yet. So, uh, But I was like – my dad played basketball. My sisters played basketball. I'll, I'll, I'll pick basketball. So I picked basketball. That was, that was one thing. And then I hit a growth spurt. But in that year I hit the growth spurt, I, I broke my wrist three times. Shit. And it was the best thing that ever happened. Uh, it was all playing basketball. But when I, when I broke my left wrist, I, I learned how to shoot one-handed. Mm. And I would just practice one-handed shots underneath the hoop. And then i get out to five feet, seven feet, free throw line. And then out eventually out shooting one-handed three-pointers. Um, and that's – Really, those six months is like when I learned how mm. to become a good shooter. Mm. Yeah, and then by the time I got to high school, I was you know, I was six four, and I could shoot the shit out of the ball. Yeah, and I had learned how to dribble on a uneven court, so yep. I could handle it. I wasn't just a standstill <laughs> shooter. And uh, and I I played for this guy uh, Boo Williams in in Hampton. I used to drive four and a half hours uh, every weekend to tournaments and practices across the state of Virginia, but it was the best AAU program on the East Coast at that time. Yeah, because that that's uh. 
that's uh, Hampton, that Hampton, uh, Newport News area. Yeah. That's where Vic came. So many great out Vic, Allen Iverson, 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 Alonzo Mourning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a serious. It's one yeah. of those hot zones. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, so, <laughs> I got. What was that like? <laughs> white white boy driving all the way across the state to go ball. And they were yeah. like, it, you know what? I I kn- I didn't think about it. And it, truthfully, when I, I started playing AAU, uh, eleven and under, Roanoke Jaguars, <laughs> and. Prior to that, I'd, I'd played a couple of years of AAU on the Cave Spring, the Cave Spring team. Yeah. Right? You know, whatever. It's like Southwest Roanoke County. It's the sticks, man. Right, right. And um, <laughs> it was all white. We were all white. Uh, but then when I, I started playing with the Roanoke Jaguars, it was all of Roanoke. Yeah. And, and it just became about basketball. There's right. just like this universal love language mm-hmm. of basketball. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. uh, who you are, what you are, who you like, right. what your skin color is, uh, how you talk. It's just like – you love the game. Can you hoop? Yep. You get along with us. All right, you're good. Yep. And so by, by the time I went to Boo Williams, it, it wasn't even like yeah. a thought in my head. Yeah. Like I'm the only one. I, I was. I think we had yeah. one other white guy. But they knew you could ball. Yeah, they, they, yeah. They, they was probably like, he could ball. Right? But look, I, I specifically, it's one of the most vivid memories of my life is the first tournament I went to. I was playing with the 17s, and I just turned 15. I just finished my ninth grade year of high school. Didn't know any of these guys. Didn't even know Boo. I'd never met Boo. Mm-hmm. And... I had to meet them for the Peach Jam. It was the first tournament in July post Nike camp. And I flew into Atlanta with two giant duffel bags. I was going to be on the road with these guys for a month straight. And I'm, I'm like going through the Atlanta airport to meet them at their gate. And I have no fucking idea what to expect. <laughs> I have no idea how this is going. I didn't even know if I was good enough to play yeah. 17s at, you know, at the time. Um, and those guys just welcomed me, man. It was it was beautiful. And, and still to this day, I talk to – a couple of those guys, we, we still have a friendship. Uh, Jason Clark, Elton Brown, who both played at UVA. Um, those were those were great years playing for Boo. Nice, nice. So, <clears throat> um, so, what's it like playing for Coach K, Duke basketball, man? Like that's like, whew, that's 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 you know that's like the Yankees of uh, college, yeah. <laughs> you know basketball college sports almost it is i don't know of a more dominant team in college sports it's first of all he's he's an icon yeah. and a legend and whatever good thing has been said about him uh as a human as a coach as a leader it's all true mm-hmm. the guy's excellent there's a there's a personal standard that he has i was around him four years and i've become friends with him as an adult he just doesn't have bad days mm. And and he has set that standard at Duke, and so the expectation is like, motherfucker, you better have some great <laughs> days too, you know. And at the time, in looking back, it was, but at the time, it just felt like a pressure cooker. And I w- was so unprepared, even though I had played high level AAU and been in the McDonald's game, I was not prepared to be in that fishbowl. Um, you know, my my ego structure, my sense of uh, self worth and self confidence and self awareness. It's just not good. So I really – I struggled my first two years. Not on the court necessarily. I, I played good. I mm-hmm. was, uh, you know, I was a leading scorer on our Final Four team in 2004. But I, I really struggled. And I had to go through uh, some deep soul searching at the end of my sophomore year. And, and that was a, a huge transitional point in my life. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I think when we were doing research for this show, um, you know, I – know enough about sports i know enough about enough things but like i didn't realize like you at one point you were the all-time leading scorer in the acc and you're the all-time leading scorer in duke history i don't i I don't know if people really unless you're like a real basketball fan like understand how good a fucking shooter you what that means i mean like so i'm trying see i'm i'm older than you (laughs) but uh, correct me if i'm wrong i'm North Carolina is in, it was in the ACC in the '80s, right? And they used to, when they were playing against Georgetown, Georgetown was in the Big East, Georgetown, Syracuse versus. Yeah, yeah. So you're talking, you're the all-time leading scorer in a conference that put out James Worthy, mm-hmm. Michael Jordan. Yeah. I mean, um, oh, Christian, Christian Leitner, Grant Hill, Grant Hill, yeah. um, Len Bias, Len Bias. Yeah. Yeah. I just just. It was a big deal. That's a big deal, man. <laughs> it's a big deal. It a big deal. Um, <clears throat> it's weird though, because when I got to Duke, 
I, I wanted, I obviously wanted to win national championships. We had the number one recruiting class in the country that year. Um, there was an exodus of players, Jay Williams, uh, Mike Dunleavy, Carlos Boozer, that all left early and would have been seniors my freshman year. Um, but the expectation was like, we're Duke. We're going to win national championships. Mm. But then the other side of that was, I really want to get my jersey retired. <laughs> and I really want to be the all-time leading scorer. Mm. And that was my mindset the second I, foot, I set foot on campus. So the Duke record actually meant way more to me than the ACC record. Mm -hmm. I had 25, 56 penciled in a notebook somewhere, you know, when I'm goal setting. Mm -hmm. I knew Johnny Dawkins' number. Mm -hmm. I still couldn't tell you what Dickie Hemrick's number was, <laughs> the Wake Forest guy who had the record. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know. I, I, I know my number just because you know, I have 27, 2769 because my rookie year I had to sign it so many fucking times on memorabilia. That's the only reason <laughs> I remember that number. But uh, but like that number, 2556, like I knew Johnny Dawkins' record. Right. And, and, I, and I was like, I, I wanted that number. And it's it was so great. The, the shot I hit was literally in front of the bench against Miami in the second half. And JD's like three feet away. And he's the first person to stand up when it goes in. Yeah. Yeah, how cool is that? Like, I think people, like, when you have a record like that, it's like, it's kind of magical when a record falls. You know, you're like, okay. They're meant to be broken. They're meant to be broken. I don't know that anybody's gonna, anybody at Duke will break my record, though. Yeah. It's a different era. Yeah, because kids are one and done now. So one many one and done. done. The best players go one yeah. and done. And, and look, truthfully, if I, if I had gone to Duke in this era, I would not have the mindset, I'm going to stay four years. Right. I would have the mindset, I'm going to, go a year or two i'm gonna try to win a national championship and then i'm gonna get fucking paid right <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you know and it's it's what it's funny like because I, I grew up in new jersey and i live there now again um like uh let's like new jersey is like uh Duke is like a JUCO for Jersey top Jersey players. Yeah, <laughs> like Rutgers could win the national championship. Dude, we could just keep dudes in state. They uh, all go down to Duke, play a year, and then they're gone. Man, it has been a it has been a nice <laughs> a nice source of players from us. I'm just obviously J. Will, Bobby Hurley, yeah. Kyrie. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's been some more guys recently, but uh, yeah, he, he look coaches. He's a, he's established such a brand there. Yeah, uh, the continuity, uh, the winning, all that stuff. And he's able to he's able to get kids from all over the country to buy into coming this place. And and look, we talk about Duke basketball all the time in 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 my world. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's college basketball, NBA, like Duke basketball is such an right. entity. And the thing that gets overlooked and not talked about enough is, and I learned this after the fact, is like you get an unbelievable education, and the Duke network is an incredible resource. Yeah. And it has been for me in my adult life. Sure. It's been an incredible resource. Yep. Whether it's donors, grads, um, managers on the team from the 90s, 2000s. Like, I've, I've built amazing relationships within that network from people that I had no connection to uh, from 02 to 06. Yeah, yeah. No, and, that, and that's another thing. I used to work with high school kids uh, and, and about going to college. And, you know, everybody plays ball thinks they're D1. And, and, and yeah. they, they, everybody thinks they're D1. Everybody thinks they're going to the NBA now. <laughs> everybody thinks they're going to the but NBA But, like, now. I used to I'm like, I'm like, listen, man. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. Okay, so you go to UConn. You go, you're going to go to UConn and ride the bench, right? I'm, I'm, I'm talking. Go to Wesleyan. It's D3. But when you get out of Wesleyan, your network of people. It's valuable. I mean, it's valuable for a job. Valuable. Way more than, like, oh, I rode the bench at UConn. And now what are yeah. you doing? Now, you you know, um. And but places like Duke and North Carolina and Georgetown, you're getting to play that top level and you're getting the network, right? Yeah. So, um, talk about. Um, I was, I was going to ask you. So, um, you did do your four years there because um, you saw the value in education. Um, do you also think that helps you as a as a player going to the NBA? Having did it allow you to mature your game, or what, what was your what was your take on um, staying all four years? Um, I it certainly helped develop me as a player um and I had a chance after my junior year to go to the NBA I, I would have probably been drafted somewhere between 15 and 20 um I was first team all-american and, and won one of the national player of the year awards that year um but I hadn't won a championship and so that's why I, mm -hmm. I that's the real reason I went back I mean you have to understand all my friends that were juniors Sean May Rashad McCants Raymond Felton like all the UNC guys but I, we were 
played against each other since we were 14 yep. or 15 <laughs> years old. So, like, all those guys are leaving. And I remember being with my dad in L.A. and at the Wooden Award, and Sean was meeting with uh, an agent. I had lunch with them. And I said to my dad, like, should I be doing this? Should I be looking into going in the NBA? And I had that thought for, like, three days. But ultimately, I went back. I, I think what it did was it, it, it actually helped me mature as a person. Mm -hmm. And that was the value uh, because uh, when I left there, I had a pretty clear sense of who I was as a player and obviously a clear sense of who I was as a player or a person. And, and that, I think, is what allowed me to withstand some of those early trials in my career mm -hmm. of, of not playing, of being, you know, being benched my rookie year or three months into the season. I think I've dressed out for like five games. I'm in a suit, you know, behind the bench. Mm -hmm. Um and that was that was hard to go through, but the lessons I learned at Duke allowed me to sort of uh, push through those 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 uh, struggles. Yeah. So let's. Uh, <clears throat> I love professionals. He like knew, he knows where the conversations going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like draft night, right? You see these. You see they ha they do a lot of doc. What's what's it like on draft night? Um, I mean, you are a lottery pick, um, but. You went. You end up going to Orlando Magic. Yeah. How did you feel about that? Like, was there a team you were hoping? Like, I'm sure a lot of teams were like, "Hey, JJ, we're looking at you." Yeah. Blah blah blah. What's yeah. what's that? What goes on in your mind like on draft night? Uh, a little backstory. <laughs> <laughs> so, about three weeks, two or three weeks before the draft, they're having the combine in Orlando, and my back had really been bothering me. It got to the point where it was like hard to stand. It was mm. hard to walk. So I get an MRI at the combine, and <laughs> I've got an uh, eight millimeter herniated disc in my back at L5 S1, and it's degenerative. It's like there's the liquid's not returning, uh, and I basically got failed by most of the teams, mm. and so I needed to get an epidural. So I went back to Duke uh, on that Monday, and this is legitimately 13 days before the draft, <laughs> and. I, uh, I I got back to my apartment. I was I was renting a one bedroom apartment near campus, and uh, there were like three people in my apartment who were living there. And so I'm like, man, fuck! I was pissed. <laughs> What's this back injury going to do to my draft status? Mm -hmm. I got to get an epidural tomorrow. There's people in my apartment. I just want to be left alone. So I just like called a friend. I was like, what are you guys doing? Oh, so and so's having a birthday. So <laughs> I go I go and I play a little beer pong, and I <laughs> I um <laughs> I. Uh, I decide I'm going to drive my buddies to a bar and then head home. And I turn out of the parking lot uh, of the apartment complex, and there's a there's a checkpoint within Oof. 100 yards. I right. turn right back around behind the wheel <laughs> all of 22 seconds. I park the car, and within uh, two seconds of me stepping out of the car, there's They're six police on. officers with their guns drawn. Uh, they throw me to the ground. And I, anyways, I, I did a stupid thing. Very, very good lesson to learn at that age. Did a stupid thing. Nobody got hurt. I got a DUI. So on top of the back injury, I've got a DUI two weeks before the draft. <laughs> so prior to those two days, yeah, I had I had preferences of where I wanted to go. <laughs> but when you're sitting in a jail cell at 4 a.m., 13 days before the draft, all you're thinking to yourself is, like, am I going to Europe? Am I going to be a second-round pick? Like, what the fuck is going to happen? So it was more a sense of relief. Yeah, I didn't gotcha. care. It was like 11th pick, Orlando Magic, fucking tremendous. <laughs> yes. Great. Glad to have that over with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's for sure, right? <laughs> By the way, the wine has just opened up. The wine's delicious. Thank man. you. Thank it's you, man. Really, it's, 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 really, it's really yummy. Um, you got to drop on baller bottles for, for, for uh, 2020. We'll do this again, and yeah. I'll, bring, I'll bring a proper baller, baller bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so then you go to the Magic. You know, like I said, you're relieved. And you mentioned a little before, so like you were you, you, you were like dressed out, you weren't even playing. You were benched. Here's here you're the all time leading scorer in Duke history. At that point you were still leading scorer in the ACC and boom. Yeah. How do you handle that? I was I, I was ashamed and embarrassed mm. and I felt like a failure. And there were times I lived uh, in Windermere, not on the lake, but I lived in the win in Windermere. There's a there's a chain of lakes. And once you cross over this one road, you're in Windermere. <laughs> And there's like this little boat ramp <laughs> right by one of the lakes. I remember driving home after one game and being like, I want to drive my car into this fucking lake. Like, mm -hmm. that's how mad I, I just, I was so angry and, and frustrated. And some of it, I think to an extent was the back injury. I missed the preseason. Uh, and then my, my second year, 
uh, I had a, I broke my hand. I've literally broken my hand seven times, Jeez, and man. and uh, all playing basketball. And I had broken my hand in the summer after summer league, and so I missed all preseason again with a new coach. So again, I'm starting a season behind the eight ball. I didn't play, and in, in about three quarters of the way through that second year, I, I had this epiphany, and the epiphany was. We're going to win 50-some games. We're going to be a top three seed in the East. Um, I don't play at all. Maybe it's not Maybe it's not someone else. Maybe it's me. Maybe mm. I need to actually be better. And, mm. and, and instead of, like, playing the victim card a little bit, I'm yeah. getting screwed by this coach yeah. or whatever. It was like, uh, let me own this a little bit. Yeah. And, and so that rest of the year, I just, I just it was like, I'm going to change my body. So it, was, it became about nutrition and recovery. I, I started lifting weights for the first time. And if you look at, like, my body at the end of that second year to when I came back yeah. for training camp, my third year for media day, it's like, oh, yeah, this is a different dude. Yeah. This is a different dude. And <laughs> and so some of it was that work. And then the other big turning point was professionally was was that playoff run we made at the end of my third year, which was when we made the finals with Orlando. And, again, another season where I'm, like, in and out of the lineup. But I had enough games where I was starting to gain a little bit of confidence and, and have some footing. And – in game five of the first round against Philadelphia, Dwight Howard broke Courtney Lee's face, our starting two guard. He literally elbowed him and broke his face. So Stan comes to me and he says, you're going to start game six, game six on the road in Philly, closeout game. And uh, I hit five threes. We win the game. Then I, 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 we're playing the Celtics, and I've got to guard Ray Allen, Ray the defending Allen. champs. I've got to guard the GOAT, Ray <laughs> Allen. And I chased his ass around for seven games. <laughs> And and played great, and um, and then we make the finals, and I, I played some of the finals, guarded Kobe, made some shots, and it was really after that I said, oh, I, I actually I belong, mm -hmm. and and that was that was the building block, and I tell young players this all the time, like, you know, your 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 role in that first year, second year, third, like your role is going to evolve over time, like if you put in the work, and if you're a good dude, and that's a lot of it. And, and you learn the nuances of the NBA game, that role is going to increase. If you had asked me, geez, second year, third year, would I ever start and average 18 a game in a season? No, never would have thought that. Mm. So, you know, you have, to, you have to have a foundation. That third year was really the foundation. Damn, I realize you – I think you average more – I averaged more in my 30s than I did yeah, in my 20s, yeah. which is crazy. But, but even more than Leitner did in his NBA career, man. It's like, you know. Yeah. Like, but, I mean, that's still so, – I mean, it's, it's just a whole different level of, of – Yeah. I, I, the other thing, too, is I remember going to Orlando and being like, oh, this guy only averages nine. I'm better than him. Yeah, no, that's a whole and different level. And you play against him in practice, you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> exactly. I, like, to average double figures in the NBA, like, that's an accomplishment. Right. right that's it, an accomplishment. Right. Like, yeah. like, like it's, it's, it's so funny, to, like, when you when – you, You've lived it, but like to be able to like to delineate like no 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 listen um, yeah like here's a dude who averaged twenty a game in college and now he averages nine like yeah. that that's it, you know that that says something for the level of competition. So then um, where'd you go after the Magic, man? I had a brief a brief sojourn in uh, Milwaukee. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> sojourn. It was uh, so I got uh, my. They fired Stan and traded Dwight after my sixth year. Okay. Um, and going into that seventh year, I had a non-guaranteed deal. So free agency, it was like up till July 10th. Free agency had started on July 1st. So there was like, I, I thought I might get traded and because I knew they were going to rebuild and get draft picks and young players. Um, they ended up keeping me. And Jacques Vaughn was really the first coach. He was our coach. He was a rookie coach. I think he was the fourth assistant the previous year mm. in San Antonio. And they bring him in, and he met with me in the preseason. He said, look, you know, you're good enough to start on this team, but we want you to be our Manu Ginobili. And I was like, great. Because that <laughs> means when I go in the game, I'm getting the ball. It, and, it and, shoot. and all of a sudden it was like, oh, that's who I can be as an NBA player. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and so Jacques, for me, was like the, the, the catalyst for the second half of my career. He gave me freedom. He understood my strengths. And um, and then and then that summer I was a free agent and I um, it was crazy the cra crazy free agency but the, the 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 brief account of it is basically I get a call the day free agency starts from uh, or my wife did 
from Doc Rivers' wife, and she was like, hey, uh, Chelsea's my, ch- my wife taught Pilates. She had taught Chris uh, Pilates. She's like, hey, Chelsea, can I pass along JJ's number to Doc? He's going to call him tonight when free agency starts. She's like, sure. So he calls me. I meet with Minnesota the next day. I meet with Detroit the next day. L.A. and, and, and Doc, of course. But L.A. decides, like, we, we're, we don't have the money for you. Minnesota makes a good offer. I commit to Minnesota. I'm driving back to my hotel. My agent calls me and says, uh, there's a chance they're going to trade Bledsoe, get off salary to Phoenix. Milwaukee would be involved. There'd be a sign and trade. Hang tight. And I'm like, well, what are you telling Minnesota? He's like, I don't know. We're just buying time at this point. So Flip Saunders, uh, rest in peace, great human mm. being. But Flip Flip is like freaking out. So it's like 2 p.m. now. And he's like, he's like, I'm taking the deal off the board. Within like five minutes, Kevin Martin signed my deal with Minnesota. Mm. So now I'm like, it's three days into free agency. I'm like, there's no money left in the free agency <laughs> market. Uh, what's going to happen? And the Clippers ended up making the trade. That, that afternoon, about 3.30, right as we're sort of getting on the plane to fly back to Austin, where we were living in the offseason at the time, I'm happy. I mean, I'm going to L.A. I never thought this was possible. I'm going to play with Chris Paul and Blake Griffin. Yeah. we got a championship contender. I'm going to play for Doc. I've wanted to play for Doc for so long. Oh, this is going to be great. So I think all is well. So we were hosting some people in Austin for July 4th. And the night of July 4th, we're getting ready to go see fireworks. It's probably like 7.30. I'm in my closet putting some clothes on, and my phone rings. <laughs> And it's Doc, and he's like, if, I don't know why he said it this way, but he's, he's like, you better play for me, motherfucker. <laughs> and I have, I have no idea what's going on. And I'm just, I'm like, Doc, that's the plan. I, I thought I thought the deal was done. That's the plan. And he's talking in these vague generalities about this deal falling. I have no clue what's going on. I, 48 hours go by. My agent will not call me back. Again, maybe not a great choice on his part. But basically what had happened is Donald Sterling had woken up July 4th in Malibu and decided that he didn't want to pay a white guy. You know, he just didn't, of it. He, he didn't, didn't want to pay a white guy. He don't like black dudes either, so that's very interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> he says, I don't, I don't want to pay a white guy. <laughs> so he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the deal back. We're not trading blood, so it deal's off. And my agent kept me out of it. Uh, Doc, obviously – Went to bat for me, and he told Do- he, he's told this story before, but he told Donald Sterling, he's like, I'm quitting. He had just gotten the job wow. 10 days ago. He goes, I am quitting. This is the worst look for our franchise. You brought me here to change the culture, change the franchise. I am quitting right now if this deal doesn't go through. And um, the deal went through. Jesus. He, he convinced Sterling to make to make the deal. And that, to me, those were the greatest four years of my career in L.A. Nice. I, loved, I loved those years. Nice. You live in some cool cities, man. You lived in Austin. <laughs> hey, low key, the coolest city is New Orleans. People don't like. There's the tourist New Orleans that we can all go to and have a good time, and be on Bourbon Street and be in the French Quarter. New Orleans is special. There's so much more to New Orleans, and I didn't realize that as a visiting player. I didn't realize it till mm-hmm. I got there. Mm-hmm. It's a special place, special people, people, special culture. Yeah, no. Um, one of our guests, Mary Mary Taylor. Was like our second guest. She's an importer. Um, she she moved to New Orleans. Yeah, you know. Um, I always wanted to go to New Orleans before Katrina, but I'm sure it's still super nice and and uh, probably got a it's got a crazy food and wine scene because insane. Yeah, insane. Yeah, and there's some there's actually some really good <coughs> wine shops in New Orleans. Um, there's one in the Central Business District that I would I would go to. Um, they had like. They had Mascarello, they had Fourier, they had mm. like all the best producers, um, and then there was another shop on Magazine Street that basically specialized in in Burgundy, and uh, you could always you could always find a good bottle in New Orleans. Nice. So, when did the appreciation for wine actually start, man? <sighs> I can tell a quick story before I get into appreciation. <laughs> talk, little talk. backstory. Yeah. So my my so that's the title of this episode. A little backstory. <laughs> a little backstory. Uh, I did a podcast the other day, by the way. <laughs> The title of it was logical and provocative, because <laughs> at times that's what I. That's we're getting now. We're yeah, getting yeah. all that here, man. Um, so, mm. my my senior year in May, uh, I hosted a graduation party for myself, or my you know my family wanted to do something for me. It was not me hosting for myself, but my family was like, "Let's do a graduation party at your apartment." Very small apartment, but we got it done. Ten, twelve people. So I go to the store, 
and I buy some white wine and some red wine. Because <laughs> at the time, I thought there was white wine <laughs> and red wine, and that was it. Uh, I just thought there were different labels, to be <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> I didn't know shit. Uh, I went to Napa in 2010, uh, right after we got married. But it wasn't our honeymoon, but um, my... Um, one of my older sisters and her husband had been on, been there on their honeymoon, loved it, and were convinced us to go. And it was like an eye opening thing, but it, it was a very touristy thing. We weren't we weren't in the know. We were just kind of driving down the Silverado Trail and turning off and to the right and turning off to the left. Mm-hmm. It wasn't it wasn't really in depth. Um, but then I then I started drinking Pinot, and and that was really the turning point for me. And then I started drinking Red Burgundy, and. This is not a humble brag. This is a straight-up brag. <laughs> the, t- the turning point for me was right after I signed with the Clippers. And we came up to New York. My wife's twin sister was <clears throat> is, lives up here, and we come up to visit with her, celebrate with her and her husband. And we went to 11 Madison Park, and we ordered a nice bottle of champagne. I looked at the Burgundy list. I said, I'll have the 90 Bouchard uh, La Romanée. We drank that. And then I said to the psalm, I said, what's the best bottle of Burgundy you have? And he said, we have one bottle left of 1978 Latash. And that was that was my hook. He said, he said run the jewels. <laughs> I said, let's do it. And it was, I mean, still to this day, it's one, I, there's certainly bottles of wine that you can remember. And I've had bottles of wine that were $25. Of course. That you remember, of that course. are so vivid in your yep. memory. And uh, and there's some like obviously some of the pet nat stuff is like amazing too and those bottles like always stick out to me because mm-hmm. they're such distinct flavors mm-hmm. but uh, that was the wine that was like I'm hooked and and then I dabbled okay I got introduced to a great uh, a great wine dealer in here in New York City through a mutual friend named Jeff Goldstern what Jeff did besides provide me access to great bottles of wine is he he's educated me. Mm-hmm. And he's taken me to wine dinners. I've met with producers and winemakers. Um, you know, this bottle itself, like when he sent me the offer, there's a description of it. We talked about it. You know, we talked about the value of this wine. Mm-hmm. Like there's not enough Malconsor that Drew Hen has to to make a, a full allocation of it. So they blend it. Had this, you know, if this was a Drew Hen Bone Romane Malconsor, this is a $500 bottle. Yeah. It's not. Right. So this is an incredible bottle of wine, yep. super young. It's going to be even more amazing in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But this is an incredible value. Yeah. And so so it's 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 obviously you, you there's the bottle of bottles right. that we take out every right. now and then. Right. But it's it's finding those those niche values that are really fun. No, I I don't have I don't have MDA money. <laughs> so I, I specialize in finding the finding the niche bottles. Yeah, yeah. Well, but but but, 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 I, it's, but that's the fun of it. Totally. The fun, is, the fun is in the education and the learning. Yeah. It's a rabbit hole that never ends. Exactly. That's yeah. what I think. Because I got out of law school. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I was like, what the fuck did I do that for? Yeah. And, and um, you know, it, if if you are, like, you can't know it all. I've had master, master MWs on this show. And, and, and one of them said, she said, she said, literally, she's like, I can never know everything about wine because vintage to vintage, the same wine is different. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so there's that. And the vintages change over time. What is a great vintage at release in exactly. 10 years is like, eh. Right. 15 years is like, oh. Right. 20 years is like, eh. Right. You know, it's just it, the beautiful thing about wine is the evolution, not just of the bottle itself. Obviously, it's a, it's a living, breathing thing. So there's the evolution of the bottle, the wine, the taste, the smell, all that stuff. Um, but it's the evolution of, of technology and, and how we grow and uh, farming practices, going to biodynamic. Um, look, the evolution in our lifetime will be how vintners deal with climate change. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. going to be a, a huge thing. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and they're they're doing that. Like uh, Bordeaux has an, introduced new varietals, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, so you said you were dabbling. So it was it was your friend Jeffrey. You said he, yeah. he, he kind of was that the impetus to actually start a collection. Yeah, so uh, no intention to start a collection. Okay. <laughs> to be clear, <laughs> no intention. Uh, if I had I known how expensive this rabbit hole was, I probably would have. Uh, once you get the taste on your lips, though, it's, it's, it's hard to stop. It's, it's hard to so stop. True. But no, what happened was I, I finished my first year in Philly. This was 18. So okay. it was about three and a half years ago. And yeah, this is May of 18, three and a half years ago. And I my friend, uh, who I knew was a collector and is one of the uh, – He's legitimately one of the b- biggest collectors in the world, but 
I was like, dude, where do you get your wine? You know, I, and I was like, I'm looking for. It was sp- very specific. I'm like, I'm looking for a 99 Latosh and a 90 Latosh. That's I. I just want one bottle of each. They were going to be celebratory for one for my career year and my wife's birthday, which was that week mm-hmm. or the next week, and then the other one was going to be in anticipation of free agency. I was going to open it when I signed my new contract. So they, that was it. And he said, look, I, I, I can get those bottles, no problem. He gave me good prices. And he said, um, if you don't mind, can I, can I send you some stuff? Let me know what you like. And so he has sort of helped me develop my palate and mm-hmm. my understanding of why do I like Northern Rhone and not like Bordeaux? <laughs> you know what I'm, I mean? I'm, I, I will take a, a, yeah. a Northern Rhone over most Bordeaux every day. Every day. I, that's just, I'm a Rhone guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, you know what, let's, we're going to, we got to take a break. We just, we're just going and going. Let me take a quick break and then we'll come back with more JJ. Okay. We're back. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, you were talking about once you get the taste on your lips <laughs> and I'm just going to buy one bottle of night at a time. <laughs> just one. Just one. Um, <laughs> so, um, so you were you know, you you were just you were still in the league for for the bubble year. Yeah. Let's talk about. Uh, we read during you know during your preparation for the bubble, you're you're back in Orlando. You, you weren't you were unhappy with the hotel's wine selection. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> how did you fr- how did you fix that? <laughs> well, look, <laughs> I didn't know what the bubble was going to be like, and ha- had I known that. Um, it was basically going to be uh, sleepaway camp for adults. I probably, <laughs> I probably would have brought my own provisions. Um, but I get there and I'm like, man, there's a lot of fucking downtime. You know, um, you can't you can't really practice once games start because of gym allocation time because everybody's playing now all day long. It's not like it's you know a seven o'clock game and a nine o'clock game. Everybody's got games all day long. So you're not practicing on off days, um, and you're with your buddies. <laughs> you know, you're with your buddies. And so I realized after about five or six days, uh, and I was, in, I, I spent literally from the pandemic to when I got to the bubble, it was the best shape of my life. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I overworked myself. I was the only outlet during the pandemic for me was like I got to escape the house. We're quarantined. I found a private gym. I would go an hour and a half a day and just run. And, and shoot hoops and I I was I, I was in great shape so I'm thinking to myself like all right I'm gonna spoil myself a little bit and get some wine down here so I bought a wine fridge on Amazon it was like a 16 bottle and I called Jeff and I said I need you to remedy a problem <laughs> <laughs> I need you to help with this situation I'm having right now um, so he sent down uh, some some white bergs and uh, a bunch of punso I, I love punso <laughs> And so he sent down like not anything crazy. Maybe it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's crazy. Now that I think about it, it's all relative, but it's crazy. Uh, yeah. but he, he sent down some like I think some 09, 06, 04, 02, uh, Griot Chamberton, some Claude de La Roche. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. No, it's it was good yeah, stuff. It's kind of and crazy. so then I'm like, we're we're you know we're NBA players, so you get wind of a guy on another team having a great bottle and then now it's a competition <laughs> yeah man. now it's a competition <laughs> so those nights after games where you've got like five or six teams everybody's decompressing we've all played that day there's nowhere to go we can't hang with our families our kids are asleep there's no facetiming our kids it's 10 30 it's like let's go meet in the players lounge bring a great bottle and I had some amazing fucking conversations in the bubble with different people. And I caught up with old teammates. I caught up with I caught up with people like Carmelo. You know, we were the same high school class. We knew each other in high school. Mm-hmm. We've known each other, but like we actually like stayed up till two one night having a three hour conversation. Yeah. Over a bottle of wine. Yep. It was beautiful. Um so everybody kind of was doing it. I, I, you know, I, I think you're referencing the Baxter Holmes article from ESPN. He wrote a great article on the bubble and the wine consumption. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was interesting. He, he drinks some good shit. He does. <coughs> he does. Yeah. He's got access to some great I, stuff. He does, man. Yeah, like, <laughs> he's got access to great <laughs> I stuff. I think on his Instagram, I'm like, God damn, Baxter. It's like it was a good night. <laughs> yeah. 
<clears throat> you know, um, and that's and what's so cool, like, like the like. Okay, so we're talking about wine, but the the whole idea behind this podcast is like people sharing a bottle of wine, the conversation you have over a bottle of wine. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, and that's. Let me so, ask you. I, you've talked. I'm sure you've mentioned this before. I'm sure somebody's asked you this before. But the the love for wine, like at its core, what do you think it is for you? It hits all. It checks all the boxes, man. It it, it stimulates you um, mentally. It's a. I think it's a mental stimulation. Like it's like it's like I liked history and shit. Like and I went to law school, so I like analyze, and and law school it's called distinguishing cases. So in a wine, you're distinguishing flavors, you're distinguishing terroir, yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it's it's you you hit on it like the wine is evolving you, like a bottle of wine is history like you 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 open a bottle and you're like oh shit so like what happened in 2019 you know um what uh you know i had that uh a 68 heights with kevin's Israeli bought i was born in 68 like i'm like damn okay maybe i'm not that old this wine yeah, is in pretty yeah, good yeah. shape yeah, yeah. you know <clears throat> um and and it's the stories it's the stories and how this beverage brings people together, but it just it just hits all the boxes, right? You know, it, it's sight. First, what do you do? First, you do you check the color, right? And then you sniff it, right? And then you know, and then you taste it, and then you taste it, and, you, and like, you know, we're not doing the, you know, tasting that, but but I'm sure we we all do that from time to time, right? And then, and then it's like, you know, we were we were like 45 minutes. I was like, I was like, oh, I took away. I'm like, fuck, this wine is changing. Yeah. It's it's that. It, it it's 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 yeah. there's no there's no other beverage like it, yeah. man. You know, it's the sensory experience. It's, it's and, a complete and, uh, sensory experience, yeah. Along with, I, I, I think if you're a learner, if you're if you're naturally yeah. just yep. interested curious. and curious, um, there's an attraction to that. For me, the 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 collection part is interesting because I've I've always collected, even as a kid. You know, I would collect GI Joes. Right. I, I would collect right. baseball cards, yeah. basketball cards. Um, and, and the original con collection for me as an NBA player was watches. And I got really into it. And again, that's a whole nother rabbit <laughs> listen, hole. I know. Listen, yeah. I, I see. Like, I'm a, well, I love watches. I don't yeah. have watch, But that's, I, you know, I have. I, I, I don't have, even wear a watch yeah, anymore. I have I don't like. Even wear a watch. I have like. I sold my entire collection. Wow. Because I realized it was a very, I don't want to say selfish, <laughs> but it was a very individualistic pursuit. There was no one other than another collector who could look at a watch right. or feel a watch, but there was no one in my orbit that right. I could share it with, right. that I could share an experience with. And I didn't say like, oh, wine does that. I realized a year, a year and a half into it, oh, wine does that. You know, this was 17, I sold my collection, so 18, I start collecting. And then I'm like, oh, now I think it's it's part of like a love language almost where mm. I'm we're having a we're having a dinner, I'm the guy that brings a couple of bottles. Exactly, you know? right, exactly. I'm hosting exactly. I hosted my family for Thanksgiving <laughs> and like I had uh, every night, like pizza this we're doing pizza this night, Thanksgiving dinner this night. We got a chef coming for my sister's birthday this night. Like I'm like in my cellar, like this is Exactly this is, this is going here. And it, I just I loved it. Yeah. I loved every minute of that. And so getting to share that with someone an experience, a conversation, a bottle, um, that to me is the juice for me. That's the juice of wine. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, shit. I, I, you know, you wouldn't have come on this podcast if I didn't <laughs> drink wine. So that's here you go. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I say a lot. I say no to a lot of podcasts. I, I, say no I would imagine. No, I would imagine, man. Um, all right. So um, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, you've been an advocate in demand the NBA address its uh, racial inequality. Um, you know, during the bubble, we saw like, um, you know, uh, players were, were making statements on in their warm up, you know, and on their jerseys. Um, but, um, you know, this is not me. This is people. People have gone to call the NFL. Well, I have before. NFL. NFL is bad to me, man. NFL is mm -hmm. definitely different owners than NFL. Yeah. Man. Not not that they're all great in NBA as we're. You know, you work for someone who didn't want to pay a white boy. <laughs> you, got, well, you got the Phoenix Suns guy. He also was on tape saying, I don't want black people at my game. Exactly. Most of his players are <laughs> black. I know. And yeah. most of the players' families it's are black. black. It's yeah, yeah. It's still the most yeah. craziest thing that's ever, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, like, you've been vocal about that. Like, and I've always said it's like, what, like, 
what makes you i mean like you're good to go like you said you got the hey, listen everybody respects each other you know in the nba and you know but like what what was it about you or the way you were brought up that made you um join the join the conversation um it's a, it's an interesting topic to talk about um and certainly if we look at it in the context of uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, um, and so many other people that that we've seen over the last three years, which all sort of came to a head last May. If we look at it in that context, um, I think if you're a human being, mm. if you're a human being that has any sort of empathy and care, uh, and th- I'm speaking just like generally, you really, it was just a natural thing mm-hmm. to, to speak out, support, ask how can I help. Um, that, it was just a natural thing for anybody, I think. Um, for me, <laughs> I've just, I've observed things. Okay. And I've seen um, and heard how people talk about athletes. And... I've I, I've always been in tune with that, and and people's perception of my colleagues, mm-hmm. uh, who majority are black, mm-hmm. and it's never sat well with me. And I've also observed uh, inequalities in our our education educational system. Mm-hmm. That was the first thing that when Chelsea and I got married, that we um, we tried to start addressing. You know wh- where where can we like where can we help if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna give resources and time to something like where can we help well, let's start there um, so I've always just I've always just had like an awareness about this mm-hmm. and again if there's opportunities to help to speak out to advocate I'm very comfortable doing that there is a fine line I want to be very clear on this and I'm not saying that I'm I've always been perfect with this, but there is a fine line of uh, like a performative uh, theater in in being an advocate for social justice. <coughs> no, I, I get into arguments with my producer all the time about that. I'm yeah, like, <laughs> it, I'm, like, I'm like, they've crossed the line. Um, I, I I would agree with that. There is yeah. a line. Yeah, and and so and so I, I think I think you. It's not even just like picking and choosing your spots. It's just like if you if and you should be compelled you know most of the time but like there there are times where hey maybe let's just listen to this conversation mm-hmm. i don't need to be the guy at the front maybe yep. it's maybe right. it's having a follow-up conversation with a specific individual maybe that's that's the helpful play here so I, I think it's just like finding that awareness the other part of this and and i've talked about this before that's i think difficult for for any athlete right now and and wh- whether you're white black whatever it, there's there's almost an obligation to speak out on anything, and I'm sure you followed this, um, this Ennis Cantor Freedom uh, issue where he's calling out different people for doing business with China, and, and acknowledge you know you know being an advocate for for um, the Mus- the Muslim population there that's that's being abused, mm-hmm. uh, and people are now asking us about that. Right, people. I remember getting asked about uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, about 18 months ago. I think it was February, March of, of uh, 2020, or maybe it was last year. Getting asked about that. Um, I'm not an expert on that. Right. Exactly. Right. I, 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 I like I, I can educate myself. I can. O- I only have so much bandwidth, mm-hmm. and and I I would just say this. Like I know what's going on in America. I I I know what's going on in America. I was a history major. My my uh, specialization was American history. My specialization within that was the Civil War and Reconstruction. I know what has happened in America. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so I feel I feel like I can speak on that not to not with authority, but like with some coming from a place of of some s- sort of knowledge. I also just uh, I've wit I've witnessed it. Like I said, I've observed things. So it's 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 just to me it has always just been a matter of comfort. And the fact that uh, I, I, I'm empathetic, yeah. I'm empathetic. Yeah. 
Yeah. <clears throat> I think you hit the nail right on the head with empathy. And also, so many great things you said. Like, there is this fine line of, you know, of, of knowing. Because <clears throat> in every movement, somebody, an activist emerges with like a 501c3 paying themselves 250k a year. <laughs> just, just keep 100. I've worked in the nonprofit world. These are, so you, you, like it's yeah. known where, and there are so many conflicts. And I could see being. There's an a athlete. lot. I would just say this. There's a lot of a lot of grifters out there. Yeah. Um. And and not just for money, but there's grifters for clout. And and, right. and especially with the way social media exists. Yeah. Um. There's there's people looking for nor- notoriety for the wrong reason. Yeah. And and. And so that's when I said earlier, just like kind of it's not even I don't want to say it's balanced because, look, there's fucked up things happening to black people. And there has been for hundreds of years. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Right. But it's 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 just saying, like, what what is what is my role in this? Let me listen to other people. What should my role be? And mm-hmm. then, like, in a smart way, and as best I can, I'm a flawed human being. Let me act on that. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, and I think you said one. Of, it's also like you said, listen. Like sometimes you got to step back and listen, you know, and chart your course. Um, so, that, you know, that's, you know, I, I agree with you. And, and being an athlete, it, being anybody who's in the media, you know, people, there are people who are trying to trip you up to get notoriety, right? Like, like you know, like, well, like, so. Well, uh, the, the, the another example of this, like, obligation to speak on things is, you know, the, the NBA media day. When all the all the reporters are asking different, are you vaccinated? Are you vaccinated? This whole vaccination thing has become so politicized. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah. And and I was talking about this earlier with somebody today. It's in 2019, um, you know, anti-vaxxers were like a fringe thing. Like they pe- were. People were lo- like, "Who are these crazy? I know. <laughs> Who are these crazy people?" Yeah. Now, now it, it's because we politicize it. It's such yep. a polarizing issue yep. that. It's become mainstream, mm-hmm. and now you're asking athletes to talk about something that, like, frankly, we're not that particularly edu- educated you're on. Not I can't, I can't break down. You're, you're not fucking how, doctors. How the RNA works? I don't know. Right. I don't know. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. You're, you're you're spot on, man. Like, it's. I remember it's like because I lived in California. And people were like, like, oh, vaccines cause autism. I'm like, they do. I got vaccinated. I'm not autistic. <laughs> you know. Um. But, um, yeah, it's, it's tough to navigate that whole thing, man. So, you know, um, and, you know, I, I will say this. I don't know what it's like inside NBA, but, like, I saw what happened to Colin Kaepernick versus, um, you know, at least the commissioner of NBA, like, being, you know, I, don't, I guess he sat down and listened to the players when they went and gave them uh, uh, the freedom to express themselves. So I, I do have to applaud that, you know, and then it's just, it's just funny, like, looking back at like the David Stern NBA, like when they were like, nope, yeah, <laughs> got to wear suits now. Like, like they, <laughs> like they, they, he, he like put the kibosh on some certain things, you know, um, the pendulum swings, yep. you know, and, and look there, there was, there was a, <sighs> you think about the, you think about the nineties NBA, how many fights there were <laughs> and Hey, look, you got to get suspended for a game or two. Right. After the malice in the palace, that was like, one extreme end of that pendulum and david stern had to figure out a way how to balance that back out which he he swung back to the other side (laughs) let's be honest uh adam has done an incredible job of finding that balance and listening to players and and really to me that's that's so important to have someone in the league the head of league office who is emotionally and intelligently emotionally intelligent enough and intellectually intelligent enough to find the balance of of working with the owners but also being an advocate for the players and acknowledging all the things that we have to go through and he's he's really truly done an incredible job when you said i'm like you know what this guy's job is he's dealing with all these billionaires yeah. and then all these millionaires and then make them come together yeah. what a job yeah. what a job <laughs> oh, what a job <laughs> Um, so <clears throat> now you, you, um, you, you retired this year or this year, um, great career, um, watched your retirement announcement. So it was really moving. It was like moving 18 minutes, man. What was, what was it? It wasn't 18 minutes. What? It was like six. Yeah, oh, man. Was... I think the whole thing was like 18 <laughs> minutes, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, what was that like? Um, because I didn't realize like you had an injury, like you you have yeah. yeah. So what what's it like to? Because when we were warming up, I believe you said, 
or somewhere in the podcast, we said, you need competition. You need to go. You were doing this at the highest level. Um, what was it like when you, when you, uh, you, you know, how did you come to the point where it was just time to walk? It was, you know, it was time to, yeah, to step away. The health, uh, the health was certainly a factor. I, um, I basically developed uh, Haglund's syndrome in my heel, which is basically an overgrown heel bone that is calcified, and it, it basically pushes on the bursa sac that's in between the attachment of the Achilles tendon and the heel bone, which causes an inflammation in the bursa sac. But what what also happened with me is uh, that insertion started to tear. So mm -hmm. I have some tearing at the insertion of my Achilles, which I still have not gotten operated on. There's no running or jumping for me for a while. But... Um, so I'm dealing with that all season, and and I had been away for two months in the bubble for my family. I went down to New Orleans. I spent, you know, between New Orleans and Dallas, I spent another six and a half months uh, away from my wife and kids. Who my son started kindergarten in 2020, so he's in kindergarten in Brooklyn. We've got all these COVID restrictions, travel restrictions. They couldn't come to see me because then he's got to quarantine for two weeks and can't go to school. So it just became very prohibitive to even see them. So in that six and a half months, I saw them three times. And between the injury and just really just being fried, um, I, I, I knew it was time to, to walk away. The hard part was letting go. Mm. And letting go is not just, you know, letting go to like playing basketball and doing something you love. Letting go is also letting go of something that is so interwoven into your identity and your ego I, i'd say you know enmeshed yeah it's just it it's part of who you are right. and that's a that's a really scary proposition um so look I, I i think i mentioned earlier but you know i i uh off and on since duke really i've i've um i've talked to mental health professionals and so i, I started talking to this gentleman two or three years ago and he's helped me a bunch with with different stuff but you know we we talked um in mid-September, and I was 99% of the way there. I knew I didn't want to play a full season, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to play half the season, get my surgery sometime in the fall, come back in February or March. And we just talked through a bunch of different stuff. And, and you know, when you start doing some time value propositions, it became so clear to me that I was ready to retire. And I can say, <laughs> I can say, you know, three months into this, whatever it is, three and a half months, two and a half months, I've uh, I've never been happier as an adult, and I'm so content with my decision. There hasn't been a single moment where I've regretted it, or even a single moment where I said, oh, I should be playing." Um, and you look at all the things that have happened since the season ended: free agency, uh, training camp, start of the season. You know, we're quarter game, quarter of the, into the season now. I watch basketball every single night. Not a single part of me is like I want to go play, <laughs> you know. That to me wow. means it was time. Yeah, it was time. Yeah, and and now you, you get to watch it and you drink some good wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like I could be out there or I could be here. Yeah, I mean, look, somebody's somebody's willing to like send me a check every week to go on TV for ten minutes and talk about <laughs> basketball. <laughs> I'm like, all right, great. <laughs> so yeah, so let's 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 talk about that, man. So you also like. Um, <clears throat> ESPN, da na na da na na. Yeah. Um, so you've already like, what's it like? So, oh, I'm trying to remember where, you know, there was a shift at some point where there are still former players, but it just became like the pundits talking mm -hmm. about sports, right? So, yeah. like you, you work with like I know so far you've been here a few months. You, you and Stephen A. Smith seem to have a a wonderful relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's it like working with like? Uh, and matter of fact, one time I think, oh, it was the uh, LeBron, the elbow. Yeah. And Steven's like was just telling you, like, I know, I talked to LeBron. <laughs> I, I watched the game, and I said, Stephen A., I played the game. <laughs> um, you know, the back and forth has been that. That to me has actually been the most fun part. Okay. And Stephen A. and I uh, have a, a great relationship, and I actually think he appreciates the banter back and I forth. I think he does. Yeah. Yeah. I um, remember when he was like a. A reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He was a beat writer. He was a beat writer, and I liked his stuff. And then, and then all of a sudden, I was like, "Damn, he blew up!" Yeah, Shit. this guy's. I mean, he's he's built um, a an insane career, and 
there is a there is a an exceptional talent there. There is an exceptional talent, and I think that's what people that can't appreciate Stephen A. Uh, they're 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 overlooking him. There's a there's a talent to the delivery and the energy and the discourse to a degree. I, I disagree with a, a lot of things he says, and I I I tell him that. But there there's there's a value to the discourse. Yeah. Because it's he's saying things that people all over the country are saying. Right. And I'm pointing out to him, not only are you wrong, <laughs> all those other people yeah. are wrong too. All motherfuckers <laughs> never played professional basketball. <laughs> um, you don't you know, again, we we've we've talked a bunch about just like finding balance and, and different things and, and so you you don't I, I'm cognizant of the fact that I don't wanna get um uh, too far into the take world that's not where i want to live yeah but i can provide what i think to be a well-informed take at times but i like talking about basketball and i like talking about a, a lot of great stories happening in the nba we, we talked about this on my podcast last week uh you know we highlighted the cleveland cavaliers they're one of the best stories in the nba this year um svp hit me up at about 5 p.m last night uh to do my sports center hit with him after the Warriors Blazers game. And he's like, Hey, here's the things I'm thinking about talking about. Let me know if any of these things interest you. And one of them was the Cavs. And I said, Scott, I would fucking love to talk about the Cavs. Let's talk about the Cavs. Um, so there's just for me, it's like, how do we, how do we highlight all the amazing players, amazing teams and amazing storylines in the NBA and, and do it in a really thoughtful, educated way. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, as a as a as a former player, and and like with with a fifteen year career, you know, like <clears throat> let's 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 look at the Warriors, like like Steph Curry's like shooting the lights out, like old Steph Curry. What's like I know you've talked about that, like <laughs> like the one two of him and Draymond. Like, what what do you what's um what is, what what do you see? Like, we got JJ here. What, 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 what do you you know at this point in the season? Who who are you looking at? Like you know, I know it's early. Anything can happen once you. But like, who who's looking? Who's like the sleeper? Who's the favorite? And like, who's like the dark horse? Mm. Sleep. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I would say there's five teams to me right now that I would consider to be favorites that, in my estimation, have created a a level of uh, sort of separation. Uh, in the West, it's very clearly the Golden State Warriors, the Phoenix Suns, and the Utah Jazz. In the East, it's the defending champs, the Milwaukee Bucks, and the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, my sleeper would be a healthy Miami team. Mm. I think they're, they can be as good as anyone. They've had a bunch of health issues. Their record's not particularly superlative, but they're, they're in the playoffs, assuming they're healthy, they're going to be a tough out for anybody. The dark horse is the Los Angeles Lakers. <laughs> like, why are we, why are we, uh, you know, just sort of uh, doubting LeBron once again? Like, this is what he thrives off of. And like, with him in the lineup, I, I think they're eight and five. Um, all the indicators over the last five or six game are way up. They've got a, a much better positive rating. Defensive rating was way down, which is what they struggle with early in the year. And Russell Westbrook has been amazing the last five games. So, I think they're starting to figure it out. I still don't like their roster construction yeah. to win it all in a playoff, you know, to win four playoff series. But they're a team that, look, whether it's through the trades or through, you know, buyout season, if they add a couple uh, pieces, they're going to be right there too. They're going to be right there too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shit. <clears throat> I got Russell, AD, they have three Hall Mello. of Famers. Four Hall of Famers. Yeah. Mellow. Yeah. And fucking, yeah, you can't count that squad out. No. No. Yeah. Um, so, did you know you were gonna get this gig with ESPN? Was, was it a plan to go into like you know you retire and you're like oh now what? Well, you got your podcasting company and you know you have your, your great pod. Um, I, I, I basically looked at it as I retired in September. I I'm gonna take a year off, and this was just an opportunity to. To basically, it's not even stay relevant, but stay close to the game. And I don't know next September what I'll be doing. I, I truthfully, I don't. Um, but with the podcast, with ESPN, you could certainly see a future uh, in, in, in 
in sports media. Um, but it, it just honestly, like, I set it up where <laughs> I record the podcast usually Monday or Tuesday night. I usually work at ESPN Tuesday or Wednesday. And then Thursday through Sunday, I can do whatever I want. Like, come on your podcast and drink wine. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, man. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It gives me enough to do. I don't, I'm not the type of person that, if you said, like, because I, when I signed with ESPN, I had a bunch of friends reach out and be like, what is wrong with you? I thought you were going to retire. What's gonna take? <laughs> and I, look, I cannot sit still for a year. Yeah. There's been a few days recently where it's Thursday or Friday. And I've taken care of everything I need to take care of. My kids are in school, and I'm I'm literally sitting on my couch twiddling my thumbs. Yeah. Literally, I used it. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, they 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 know, man. Like 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 I'm like okay, so we're wrapping up. We'll be wrapping up season three, and I'm like, shit. I don't know if I could take three weeks off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I'm like. You know what momentum matters though. Yeah. Momentum matters in life. I agree. And I'm, it, it, there's, it, it's a, uh, this is like a, I, I did not do particularly well in physics, I'm not going to lie, but this has to do with sort of inertia. Is it inertia? Inertia, I, yeah. yeah. Inertia, yeah. Yeah. Uh, b- object in motion. Uh, object in motion yeah, tends to stay in motion, yeah, right? Yeah. So, like, um, you know, it's, 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 it, I, I feel you. And, like, like, I, 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 I feel like I go crazy sometimes. Like, look, I'm like, ah. You know, I'm like, someone so's in town. I'm going to do an episode. <laughs> <laughs> and Lai's like, I'm on vacation. I'm like, all right, I'll do it myself. <laughs> the thing I like about a podcast is there's always, well, not always, but there's, um, as the host, there's a there's a performance component to it because you're you're creating something. Yeah. You're, 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 you're making a product. You're making content. And especially if it's a good episode and – that's a very subjective thing, obviously. But, no, I, but f- I know I know what you mean when you yeah, say that. Yeah. You, 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 you stop recording, guest leaves, close up shop, and you're like, there's a feeling you get when you've made good content. Mm-hmm. That also is that is a little it's a little druggy. There's a there's a there's an adrenaline kick there that's it's really nice. It's nice. Yeah. So what what so I used to do a podcast with uh, Yahoo Sports, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, I obviously enjoyed it, but what was really what was the thought between uh, behind? Is it uh, three four two? Three four two. Yeah. Three four two. Okay. Um. So we we did uh, I did forty episodes with Yahoo. I did a bunch of episodes by myself with The Ringer, and then Tommy Alter, um, who was working for Bill when I met him in two thousand sixteen. I just was like, yo, we've done a couple of mailbag episodes together. Let's, why don't we do a, you as the co-host and just make my life a little easier. Uh, and then we did whatever, 10 episodes. And then the pandemic started and we went to quarantine. And all of a sudden, although the product had existed for a long time, we discovered Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that was so And funny. we're like, wait, <laughs> we can record remotely? <laughs> This is amazing. So that whole spring, we started putting stuff out, and then, and then uh, George Floyd was murdered, yeah. and that was uh, a big turning point for both of us because we realized, like, I want, I just want, if I'm going to have this thing, like, I want to be able to do whatever the fuck I want to do and talk about whatever the fuck right. I want to talk about, right. and. So we we decided we were just gonna like shop the thing and um, you know because we'd had a proof of concept we got a, a few offers uh, just to basically from ad sales partners but we were gonna start our own company we're gonna own the thing like I I did a hundred episodes I didn't own the IP I didn't own the RSS feed the Ringer used our RSS feed used our subscription mo- you know base to to put a new podcast they put a new NBA podcast on there with two different guys uh, they're both nice guys but like I'm like come on man like yeah. we did that you built that i built that you yeah built that and lesson. um and we launched it in the middle of the bubble the timing was great because there was nothing no real content coming out of the bubble right and <laughs> uh people people immediately started you know like really uh, attaching themselves to it and we have a, a great listener base our um we also own our youtube channel which 
that has been to me that's like the been the most fun is like seeing that community grow i i didn't really spend a ton of time on youtube before we started that channel and now i'm addicted to youtube not i'm not on my channel i'm, I'm like i'm a golf nerd so i I'm just i only subscribe to golf channels and i go down these two-hour rabbit holes oh of watching God. uh drone videos of golf courses <laughs> youtube is the worst it's uh, the best in the worst. It's like yeah next for you yeah, <laughs> yeah. but if you're look if you're gonna to, it, I, I, people ask me all the time, like, what does it take to be, do a podcast? Like, the, the number one thing is just consistency. Right. Like, there has to be a desire to actually do a podcast consistently. And if you don't have that desire, you shouldn't really start. Because there's there's days where I got to record and I'm like, ah, I don't really want to do this today. But you do it. Yep. And then there's a lot of days where you're like, I can't wait to have this guest on. This would be right. an awesome conversation. Right. And and those days are good, too. But um, you just got to be consistent with it. There's really no other way to do do a podcast. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> are you like you own the IP? Are you going for you? You planning on growing out your network? You're going to host other podcasts, produce other like what? What's uh, what, what, what's your thought on this? I think this is this is the start of basically our creative year. Okay. Which is how do we make other content? The the model of right now for the size of our company we have four employees the, the model for the size of our company to go start other podcasts is so much work for next to nothing in terms of money there's just no way for us to true that no this, <laughs> there's just no way to to really to make money off of it that way right when we're essentially the middleman because yeah. the talent's going to get paid a certain amount and the company selling the ads are going to pay be paid a certain amount so the decision we have to make is like do you know? Do we go in house? The problem with that is Cadence, who is our partner, has been an incredible partner for us. Um, they've been they've been just wonderful to work with, and you know I, I would love to continue to work with them. So then it becomes, well, what other content can we create? How do we build out our YouTube channel? We we have a we have a couple sh uh, TV shows essentially that we are working on uh one we are going to start filming uh in january uh that will live originally on our our youtube channel but it's it's gonna, it's comedic yeah, i'm not the host it's gonna be awesome i can't wait to, to watch it uh and then and then we're working on a uh, another show that we have begun to pitch to different uh high level production companies and uh and streaming platforms so uh that's kind of where we're at with year one and 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 then but look the, the the base of it is like how do you how do you make your product better how do you grow your product yeah. how do you grow your audience how do you grow your business and we actually have like a legitimate business with old man and the three and yeah. you know we're always kind of thinking of ways to to grow that that's got to be the driving force for anything we do yeah so <clears throat> um you're you you're someone who could probably live anywhere in the world they want to live <laughs> You know, I mean, I directly anyone could do that, you know, but like you could live anywhere in the world and enjoy it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, what what had you moved to New York City? So my mother, uh, as I mentioned, I think she worked at the first all female co-op on Wooster Street, AIR, Artists in Residence, mm. um, right after college. Oddly enough, Artists in Residence is now. Uh, across the street from my apartment in Dumbo. How about that for a small world? Um, I also found out after the fact, my mother, her, the, the Ann Healy was uh, her sort of uh, teacher um, at AIR. My mother was her apprentice. Ann Healy took a sabbatical for, for half a school year, and my mother taught her sculpting class at my kid's school. In, the, in like 1976. It's just, it's crazy. So anyways, when I was a kid, my mom would come up here for AU tournaments or whatever. My mom would take me on the subway. We'd go to Soho. Um, you know, we'd go to Midtown, of course. Um, but we'd explore all these different neighborhoods. And I just loved it. And I always said to myself, as a teenager, I'm, I'm going to live in New York City someday. I ended up marrying a woman who has an identical twin sister. And that <laughs> twin booked, in 2012, booked a one-way flight. Uh, with no job and no friends and no place to stay to New York City. She happened to know of a guy 
and she asked him, can I crash on your couch for a month? She, at the time, she was, I think, going to be a yoga instructor. <laughs> she crashed on the guy's couch. She got her yoga certification. That lasted like two weeks. She ended up working in, in PR for uh, a number of years. She's now married to that man. With They have two kids. <laughs> well, we started having kids. We... Uh, we just we just miss being on the East Coast, mm-hmm. and we 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 miss being around her. And uh, I've developed a great friendship with uh, my brother-in-law as well. I mean, they're the reason we're here. I mean, I I, I could have stayed in Austin. We we thought about living in Manhattan Beach in, mm-hmm. in L.A. where where we rented for four years while I played there. Again, great options. Uh, there's a lot of places around the country that I can I, I can have a good life there. Yeah. There's nothing like New York City. Yeah. There's nothing like New York City. And now that I have children. Um, I want to raise my kids here. Um, I, I I think about the kids that I met at Duke and the little bubble that I lived in growing up. How small that bubble would be if I hadn't played basketball. Mm. Basketball is what exposed me to the world. But in New York City, you're just you're just exposed. And those kids at at Duke when I first got there were so far ahead of me in all walks of life. Um, they just they knew more. They were more confident. Um, they were they they were more cultured. And and, and so yeah, I just I love the energy here. I love the food. I love uh, Broadway. I, I I love museums. Like I love Central. My wife and I went for a walk in Central Park. We don't even live in Brooklyn. I mean, we we don't even live in Manhattan. We went for a walk in Central <laughs> Park the other day. It was thirty eight degrees. It was so enjoyable. Like I just love living here, and um, and it's it's where I want to raise my family. Which is crazy to some people. It's crazy. <clears throat> but for all the reasons you said, it's so true. Like, I remember I grew up in Jersey. It would come in the city. But, like, you go off to college and you meet kids who grew up in New York City. They're just at a different level. They're just at a different level, culturally sophisticated, just um, uh, the street smarts of a kid. Like, I'm like, what? You used to, you used to take the subway to school. <laughs> like, yeah. But, yeah. Like, like yeah. talking about in the 80s, in New York kids, these 80s, take, you know. And so, but I just, it just is a. Uh, you know, I, I think that's great that you you you're 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 doing it for all the right reasons. You're, 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 I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it this way: like we all we're human beings and we're tribal. Okay, let's just establish that. And so, whether we like it or not, we 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 put ourselves in these silos. And maybe the doors to the silos are opened, maybe they're closed shut. But you're in a silo no matter what. You're in your little bubble mm-hmm. of, of whatever. It, you have kids and like. Your, your friends end up being the parents of your kids' friends. Like, that's just how it works. But I, the, the bubble that is New York City, there's just nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. I could never imagine at this stage of my life going and living in suburbia in a cul-de-sac. Like, like I just can't. Like, it's not for me. It's not for me. It's not for me. JJ, shit, man. Thank you so much for uh, coming in this afternoon, man. We really appreciate your time, and the conversation was off the chain. Uh, the bottle, absolutely delicious. Um, y'all heard of me say we got to do this again, so we'll figure that out. Um, we'll make it happen. Yeah. We'll make it happen. And uh, yeah, here's the only, my only request is, this is my only request. I'm going to come on the show again. Okay. I'm going to bring, not that this wasn't a great bottle, but I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring a great bottle. And my only request is that you wait to release your top wines of the year on the podcast until after I come on the show. My only right. request. Okay. It's a deal. <laughs> you got a deal. All right, everybody. It's your boy, MJ. Until the next time, cheers to the Mavericks. He played for the Mavericks. Uh, philosophers, deep thinker. You are all of those, and you're definitely a wine drinker. Everybody, peace. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>